It's an outcome that seemed inconceivable as recently as a year ago. And when we published our first full-length video on Myanmar Civil War last May, our conclusions were as gloomy as those of most analysts. While the rebels had a strong base of support across the nation, the sheer bloodthirstiness of the military junta meant that a victory for opposition forces was unlikely. Without outside intervention, we could see nothing in the future but a continuing bloodbath where rebel victories would be localized at best and the junta would keep using its superior air power to massacre civilians at an eye-watering scale. Well, what a difference 11 months can make. Fast forward to today, and the rebels seem on the verge of doing what nobody predicted. They seem to be on the verge of winning. Back in October, a coalition of anti-government ethnic armies launched a counter-offensive in Shan State on the border with China that exceeded all expectations. Known as Operation 1027, it seized swaths of territory, captured hundreds of hunter-aligned soldiers, and took control of key border crossings. Even more impressively, it stretched the military so much that armed groups achieved breakthroughs in other parts of the country. The Council on Foreign Relations lists a few of the successes that followed. The Iraq Army capturing several important Myanmar army bases and training schools in western Myanmar. The Karen, or Kayin, ethnic militia taking control of the vital border town of Marwari. Anti-regime forces launching a drone strike on the capital and junta stronghold Napiador. These are just a flavoring of some of the victories the rebels have had in the last few months. If you want more details, we've got several episodes in the archive that followed these advances and others as they were happening. For today's story, though, all you need to know is that one, anti-regime forces are advancing across the board, and two, the effect of this has been to leave the military looking weaker than it has in decades. According to estimates by the United States Institute of Peace, the junta had by February lost at least 30,000 troops from an army that totals only 150,000. Although they've since instituted forced conscription, their casualties have kept stacking up. The Economist, meanwhile, reports that morale in the army is at rock bottom, while the loss of strategic border towns has severed the junta from the smuggling rackets that made up a large part of its income. On the global stage, things are looking no less grim for Myanmar's generals. Long backed by China, they lost Beijing's support by allowing local mafias to run vast online scams that targeted Chinese nationals. Indeed, it now seems that China supported Operation 1027 as a way of smashing these illegal businesses. At the same time, the rarest rebel groups are united unlike ever before. As we recently covered in a video giving some background to the Civil War, Myanmar has spent decades enveloped in multiple ethnic conflicts, some of which began as far back as 1948. But with the various militias often fighting among themselves and lacking in coordination, the military was able to retain its stranglehold by catering to the Burma Burmese majority and stifling dissent. That all changed when the general seized power in a 2021 coup after a decade of gradual liberalization and steps towards democracy. When young urban Burma protested, the military started killing them in a brutal crackdown. This drove many to take up arms in rebellion. Since those arms were often literally only slingshots and Myanmar remained divided on ethnic lines, the rebellion initially looked unlikely likely to succeed. In the words of foreign affairs, many observers had written off such resistance groups as too fractious and weak to present a genuine challenge to the junta. But that all has changed. With the various militias today engaging in unprecedented coordination, the generals are now facing a majority uprising, one that could soon drive them from power. To be clear, we're not saying that the end of Myanmar's hunter is imminent. As The Guardian notes, it still retains control of the center of the country, including the big cities of Yangon, Mandalay, and Naypyidaw. Speaking to the same paper, Richard Horsey, Myanmar advisor to Crisis Group, likewise pointed out that the Burmese military, quoting, isn't at the moment collapsing as an institution. This isn't the fall. Of Kabul. Still, things look bad enough for the hunter that this seems like a perfect time to step back from the current war and ask an important question. What comes next? Assuming the rebels continue to make gains, what does the future hold for Myanmar? It's our goal in the rest of this segment today to try and answer that, to see what experts believe might be the most likely outcome of the conflict and what form a post-civil war Myanmar might take. The outcome many are hoping for? A united Burma with the many ethnic states working together inside a democratic federation. This is the vision that the opposition National Unity Government and three major ethnic armed groups unveiled this January. One that foresees the defeat of the military and, in the words of foreign affairs again, the remaking of Myanmar, quoting, as a federal democracy, bestowing equal rights to all communities regardless of their ethnic, religious, or racial configurations. This is an extremely utopian vision, perhaps given the long history of tensions between various ethnic groups, even a bit of a naive one. But it's also at least somewhat plausible. The same foreign affairs piece points to the current high level of cooperation between multiple militias as a sign that working together is possible. 
and there are already examples on the ground of what a federal Myanmar might look like. In tiny Kayan state, political, civil society, and militia leaders have formed an interim executive council that has taken over the functions of local government. Importantly, one of the IEC's stated goals is to prepare Kayan state to join a democratic federal union. As one of its leaders told The Economist, we are well aware that the international community may worry about a power vacuum and warlordism. Hence, the IEC's moves to create a local, integrated federal army of multiple ethnicities. The Iraq army of Rakhine State likewise performs local government functions, from policing to medicine. Such services are being offered to both Buddhists, who make up the majority, and those from the Muslim minority. Clearly, many in Myanmar want a future multi-ethnic state to succeed. Sadly, though, such success is not guaranteed. For starters, even today, few of the ethnic militias want to work with the Rohingya community, who suffered genocide at the hands of the military last decade and are still discriminated against. For another, any future state that emerges will still be majority Babar. According to reports, some minority communities are worried that the National Unity Government secretly wants to turn the clock back to the pre-coup days oh, when freedoms were growing for young Babar, but other groups were effectively sidelined. There are other issues, too, like how to distribute limited resources in a nation devastated by conflict, or the lingering potential for distrust between different communities, issues that are serious enough that some analysts don't foresee a democratic federal Myanmar ever arising. Instead, many think the future has something different in store. Domination by China. Right now, China is the only outside power that's involved in the conflict in more than a cursory way. While other Asian nations send aid or make grand proclamations about peace, Beijing is the only capital getting its hands dirty, backing the Triple Brotherhood Alliance that launched Operation 1027. This simple fact has made many wary of the prospects for a democratic Myanmar. As The Guardian notes, China sees a divided and weak subservient Myanmar as ideal. It doesn't want to have sort of a Western-leaning liberal democracy on its border. The more the junta falters, the more likely a Myanmar forged by China's preferences may become. Beijing already has open channels with many of the ethnic armies and hasn't been shy about flexing its muscles. Recent military exercises along the border of Kachin State were interpreted by USIP as a sign that the People's Liberation Army might be willing to intervene if neighboring regions become too unstable. Barring the involvement of other outside powers, actions like this may lead to more rebel groups accepting some sort of subservience to China as the price of defeating the junta now and not sparking an invasion in the future. To see what that might look like, we can look to Wa State, an autonomous part of Myanmar that was outside of the government's formal control even before the 2021 coup. Backed by Beijing, Hua is technically a part of Myanmar, but in practice it functions more or less like a Chinese province. Chinese currency is used locally, and the Hua state laws tend to mirror those implemented by the CCP. The result is a state with some autonomy, but one that's broadly a satellite of Beijing. Some analysts like Avinash Palawal have suggested this might wind up being the model for a post-conflict Myanmar. Although, how welcome that would be? That's another matter. To quote The Economist, a Myanmar over which China establishes dominance is in no country's interests but China's. Of course, both these scenarios assume some degree of stability after the hunter is defeated. But that's far from guaranteed, which is why there's another scenario in play, the breakup of Myanmar. This is the scenario the junta and its supporters like to talk about, since it stokes fears of an even bigger humanitarian crisis if they're allowed to lose the current war. Back in November, the president warned that gains by the rebels could lead to the country breaking apart. In this case, the president was using the specter of a full-scale collapse as a way to encourage support for the military. But that doesn't mean the disintegration of Myanmar is not a real possibility. Foreign Affairs notes that a failure by the many ethnic militias to negotiate post-war settlements among themselves could result in something like Afghanistan in the 1990s, a land where warlords dominate their local region and various groups are in constant conflict. Yet, there's another possibility too, one that in its own way may turn out to be even darker than a full-scale collapse. What if the hunter ultimately survives the war? This analysis comes from the Australian-based Lowy Institute, and while its take is against the grain, it does come back with evidence. In this telling, the junta is absolutely suffering humiliating defeats at the moment, but it isn't suffering anything close to a knockout blow. As the think tank notes, 
No state capital or Mama Military Regional Command Center has fallen. Even as its frontiers collapse, the junta holds on in the center, relying on air power and on strategic depth that protects its arms production. The Institute's analysis goes on to note that the generals still control important economic hubs like Yangon, as well as major ports where they can import jet fuel and weapons. Vital air bases remain unthreatened, as does the military industrial manufacturing belt at Pae in Magwe region. And that last one is important because it means the Hunter's ability to produce everything from small arms to artillery shells and missiles has been unaffected by recent rebel gains. And that could allow the generals to step up their indiscriminate attacks on civilian population centers in an attempt to break the rebels' will to fight, a method Bashar al-Assad, backed by Russia, used to win the Syrian civil war at a horrifying price. The Lowy Institute ultimately stops short of suggesting the Hunza might win the current conflict, but their report offers a gloomy counterpoint to many other theories of what comes after the war. After all, if the generals still cling to power in the central most productive zones, what hope will there be for a union of the weaker peripheral states? Taken together, then, these different analyses offer a range of visions for Myanmar's future, some perhaps more likely, some less so. To be clear, this is far from a comprehensive overview. There are other potential outcomes we didn't have time to touch on, and it's possible that none of these turn out to be correct. Predicting the future is a notoriously difficult game. Still, it's hopefully at least clear that thinking about Myanmar's future is something the world should be doing right now, not least because there may be only a limited window after the fighting stops to help usher in a democratic nation free from Chinese influence. The sooner our leaders start planning for that moment, the more likely they are to succeed when the time finally comes. In our next story today, we turn to the border region between the nations of Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or DRC. The DRC has been a fixture on the Situation Room for some time, marked by an immensely complicated civil war in its eastern regions, a widely discontented populace, an authoritarian leader, and immense natural resources that make it a target for exploitation by a wide range of foreign powers. But in recent weeks, the Congo and Rwanda have found themselves increasingly on the brink of a direct confrontation as hostilities that have simmered for years come within mere inches of boiling over. The place to start is in the besieged eastern Congolese city of Goma. There, a pre-war population of some half a million has been cut down by a mass exodus, while those who remain find themselves encircled. Outside the city, laying in wait across the countryside, are a rebel movement called M23, who've been engaged in a major offensive since 2022 and have shown very little inclination to keep to any of the ceasefires that they frequently agree to. M23, led by members of the ethnic Tutsi group, are said to be a proxy force for nearby Rwanda, whose leaders, including nearly 24-year incumbent President Paul Kagame, are also Tutsi. Most Western leaders and analysts seem to agree that Rwanda does indeed support M23, but Rwanda denies those allegations vehemently. And whether you believe them or not, they're wise to get those denials on record. M23 is accused of engaging in a very, very long list of atrocities that we simply aren't going to describe in detail because, well, we quite like having a YouTube channel. And in and around Goma, the situation is getting very bad very fast. News from the city in the last week has revealed that the Congo's Republican Guard a unit meant to be among the country's most elite warfighters, has taken to wandering the city and shooting civilians, some because of suspected rebel activities, and some just indiscriminately. Also at work, beside the Republican Guard, are the so-called Wazalendo, or Patriots, ex-rebels including war criminals with a long history of fighting against the Republican Guard, who now fight beside the government to defeat their shared enemy, M23. Completing the Congo's fighting coalition inside Goma, the local police and youths who seem to have talk to the guard into giving them weapons. Civil leaders inside Goma tell of the Republican guards and their armed allies getting into shooting matches with each other or civilians when they're drunk, a frequent occurrence, and taking items including money and radios by force. On March 5th of this year, a militiaman accused of sexual assault was lynched by a group of displaced internal refugees, but those sorts of vigilante acts have only served to make the stakes even more dire for everyone when skirmishes and disputes break out in a city that's very much on the edge. At this point in the conflict, the Congo appears increasingly ready to take the fight directly to Rwanda instead of keeping up the veneer that this encirclement of Goma is simply a bunch of homegrown rebels. The DRC has disengaged from priest talks with Rwanda and has grown increasingly forceful in its rhetoric against Rwanda of illegally occupying part of the Congo's North Kivu province. 
The country has accused Rwanda of pillaging the DRC's territory, while Rwanda has railed against the Congo's alleged violence against its ethnic Tutsi population, even saying that the region is yet again on the brink of genocide. All the while, the areas of the Congo most impacted by the fighting are experiencing a vast humanitarian and gender violence crisis, something that the UN's Humanitarian Operations Director Eden Musono described in September of last year as, quote, frankly, the worst situation we have ever seen. By all accounts, the Congo would very much like to be at war with Rwanda, while Rwanda would very much like to be at war with the Congo. But for the major powers of the world, particularly the United States, that's going to be a problem. The US is Rwanda's largest single nation donor, giving the country $170 million of assistance in 2023 in a manifestation of continued friendship that owes its roots to American shock and horror at the Rwandan genocide decades ago. The US has become increasingly aware of Rwanda's questionable conduct, with the American State Department even condemning the country outright in February for backing M23. But on a fundamental level, America prefers to keep its relationship with Rwanda instead of throwing it away. Not only America, but the entire international community holds financial leverage over Rwanda. Over 40% of the country's budget comes courtesy of foreign aid. At the same time, the international community has a vested interest in the incredible reserves of copper, cobalt, gold, and diamonds in the Congo. And while Congolese President Felix Tshisekedi doesn't get much love from other leaders around the world, he is certainly tolerated as a stable enough, reliable enough guy that the world would prefer to see him preside over a nation that isn't at war. Regionally, this little slice of Africa is having a tough time more broadly. Shishikedi has a whole lot of problems at home and abroad before even thinking about the M23 offensive, including both political pressure against his recent re-election and a wide array of international influences trying to get at his nation's resources, often operating at odds with each other while in the process. Rwanda, while more stable, has its own stark population divides and domestic turmoil. Burundi to the south is exceptionally poor and exceptionally undeveloped, and its wealthy elite couldn't agree on how to tie their own shoes, let alone take sides in a war between two of their neighbors. And Uganda to the northeast is about to begin a succession crisis with the potential to turn very bloody, functionally taking any large-scale peacekeeping efforts off the table. The Congo relies heavily on private military contractors, particularly Romanian mercenaries, to make some sort of difference in its civil conflicts, and it's facing violence from other corners too, including from a regional branch of the Islamic State that's also launched attacks on Uganda. Russia, China, the United States, and the United Nations, and an incoming South African military intervention are all trying to intervene in relatively minor ways to draw down the conflict. But broadly, those efforts are expected to be badly insufficient. Those nations of the world who could put a stop to this whole thing easily have no desire to commit their resources. The nearby nations who have a desire to see the region remain at peace have no resources with which to impose that peace on their neighbors. If there is one bright spot in all of this, it's that there are no indications that the Congo is in a place to win a war against Rwanda anytime soon. It's proven unable to deal with M23, and its military is notoriously corrupt, and in many areas of its overall architecture, grossly inept. Even on paper, the Congo has a military barely more than 150,000 troops, a few over 100 old main battle tanks, only limited artillery, and a grand total of one fighter jet and six attack jets. And that's before we take into account the fact that many of those machines are in disrepair, and many of those soldiers won't show up for battle in situations where they aren't likely to win on numbers alone. The Rwandan military, while a good deal smaller, is also much more experienced. It's the fourth largest contributor of troops to UN peacekeeping missions worldwide. It's enjoyed years of US support, and it's taken an active role in combat zone interventions in Mozambique and the Central African Republic. It's got better equipment, it knows how to use it, and when we account for the sheer volume of DRC equipment that's probably out of service, Rwanda's mere 34 main battle tanks, handful of multiple rocket launchers and artillery, as well as zero armed warplanes and five attack helicopters, still might go further than what the Congo has in stock. And Uganda, too, would likely come to the aid of Rwanda if war broke out, bringing hundreds of main battle tanks, tens of thousands of troops, and a grand total of 10 fighter aircraft, five of which were designed within the last four decades. Which is nice. All of that should be enough to deter the DRC from launching an attack on Rwanda, except there's a catch. 
Let's say the DRC does start hostilities with Rwanda. Shishikedi draws on popular sentiment, rallies spirits for a war, and gives himself a little political boost at home. Then Congolese soldiers attack Rwanda directly, and Rwanda responds, thus entering into a war footing that places it directly alongside M23 and hands the DRC a see I was right sort of victory. Rwanda wins its military engagements, probably helped by Uganda, and then the world very quickly realizes that if Rwanda and Uganda decide to start a counteroffensive, which at least Rwanda would be inclined to do, and Uganda's likely next leader and current Nepo baby, Chief of Defense Forces, would probably be all too happy to take part in, then not just the Congo's government, but its precious natural resources may become threatened for months or even years. Put simply, Felix Shishikedi and the DRC do not have the means to win a war against Rwanda right now. Quite frankly, they probably don't have the means to win a war against the 135 polearm-wielding members of the Vatican Swiss Guard right now, but they do have the potential to react to what looks like an impending military defeat in an urgent situation by creating the sort of chaos and perceived instability that will have global powers tripping over themselves to bring about a resolution to the conflict. If there is one thing the Congolese government knows for well is that the US, Europe, Russia, China, and most of the rest of the world doesn't really care about the Congo, but they care about the resources that the Congo's got. Faced with a situation that will spiral rapidly and result in an M23 victory, if those same world nations don't care enough about the Congo to intervene, well, Felix shishikedi has got a way to make them care, and the latest news out of this region would indicate that if Shishikedi is going to act, now's the moment. Moving on, we turn to the world's most populous nation, not China, but as of mid-2023, actually, India. Almost a year to the day after India surpassed China in population, the nation is rolling into a major electoral cycle, one that's slated to take a total of 44 days to complete, and is widely expected to bring Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi waltzing into a third consecutive term. But today, just shortly after India's election season kicked off, we're not going to talk about campaign rhetoric or exit polling. Instead, we're going to focus on the rising concerns around repression in India's political system and how the country's populist political control, Hindu ethno-nationalism, and a weaponized structure of government all come together to create the potential for significant violence. If Gujarati-born, 73-year-old Prime Minister Modi is re-elected, surging to his third inauguration on the back of his own Bharatita Janata or BJP political party's support, then he'll begin a term slated to last for five years, eventually finishing out in 2029. But to frame this question as an election of if Modi will be re-elected doesn't match up to reality. Modi is going to be re-elected. The only question at this point is how big of a margin is he going to get and how much support is he going to get in the legislature. Modi, as we're going to see across this election, is very, very popular, with approval ratings consistently at or above the high 60s or low 70s, marking him as the world's most popular major leader among nations where the third-party political researchers can run reliable polling. And nor will Modi face any constitutional crisis or even backlash for pursuing a third term. After all, India places no term limits on its prime ministerial post, and by law, Modi is welcome to run and run again for as long as he wants. But while the Modi administration is exceedingly popular, it's also worth examining just how Modi and his fellow BJP leaders have gotten so popular with the people. And in addition to his many impressive foreign and domestic achievements, another big part of the answer lies in his promotion of Hindu ethno-nationalism. While India is, on paper, a secular state and a multi-faith nation, home to about 200 million Muslims and 80 million Christians, Modi's rule across nearly 10 years has been marked by a sharp swing toward a Hindu-first agenda called Hindutva. The BJP and Modi have been widely accused of passing policies and pursuing broad social change that would shape India into a fundamentally Hindu state, while stoking fears around the Muslim minority community that implicate them in everything from a population and demographic shift to a wave of illegal immigration to a phenomenon most of the Western world calls interfaith marriage, but much of India refers to derisively as love jihad. India has even passed laws against religious conversion as a result of this conspiracy, claiming that Muslim men were tricking Hindu women into marrying them and then forcing them to convert to Islam. More broadly, the BJP openly admits its embrace of the Hindutva agenda, seeking to reframe it as an issue of Indian identity, which in turn has helped it gain broad appeal for Indians within the Hindu majority. And with that tend toward Hindu ethno-nationalism has come a rise in violence among Modi's supporters, a trend that Modi and his administration don't seem to take issue with. 
when a Hindu mob destroyed a 16th century mosque because that mosque was at a site that Hindus believed to be the birthplace of the god Ram, Modi responded by building a grand Hindu temple on the same site, a process that was made into a public relations centerpiece of Modi's second term. It was the Indian government's biggest investment ever in a city of that size, equivalent to over 3 billion US dollars in a city of barely 55,000 people, and it enraged even some Hindu clerics who took umbrage Modi's clear use of the faith as a political prop. When Modi's supporters in parts of India began engaging in more brazen acts of political violence against religious and ethnic minorities, including even killings, Modi and his administration declined to take action. In one incident in March 2023 that made global headlines, a Muslim man in India's eastern Bihar state was attacked by a mob after he was accused of carrying beef, being drawn from an animal that is revered as sacred in Hinduism. That man would die in the mob violence, for which only three people would face justice among over 20 that the incident's police report claimed had surrounded him. And back in 2021, Hindu priests in India's Uttarakhand state made calls for the killing of two million Muslims there, calling for Hindus to be, quote, prepared to die or be prepared to kill in an incident that set off alarm bells among global experts on genocide. Mob violence and discriminatory attacks against minority populations have become increasingly common in India, while opponents and critics of the BJP, including journalists and political leaders, have been subject to a growing pressure campaign. Now, we've got to emphasize here that these lynchings and other public shows of aggression are not something where Modi is calling for them to happen or celebrating them when they do. But just like a very long list of religious nationalist or ethno-nationalist leaders throughout history, Modi's leadership has created a culture against religious tolerance or political secularism and creates an environment where people with hardline beliefs or who are already inclined toward these sorts of nationalistic ideology are more easily drawn toward extremism and with it violence. Again, we have got to be clear here, this is not a problem unique to Modi or India, but instead a far broader trend that pops up across many separate ideologies in all corners of the world, but under similar conditions. A proudly and sometimes forcefully nationalist leader and a populist political structure that thrives on putting most people into a majority and addressing smaller non-minority groups of people in ways that cause them to be marginalized is a recipe for extremism among a growing fringe of hardliners, and as that extremism goes up, so does the likelihood that violent incidents will take place. In this election cycle, the Modi government has shown an increasing willingness to strong-arm journalists, critics, and political opponents across India. That's a decision that doesn't seem to be motivated by any fear that Modi would lose the election. In fact, at this stage, his re-election would be a foregone conclusion, even if a strong opposition movement were allowed to thrive. Instead, it's a matter of ideological dominance and legislative control, two things Modi appears to want very badly. His main rival, India's Congress party, has been bogged down with corruption charges against its political elite for months, despite a fairly low rate of actual convictions, and dozens of other politicians from various opposition parties have been either thrown in jail or gifted lengthily convoluted investigations of their own. One month before the election, Modi froze the Congress party's bank account for non-payment of taxes. Peaceful protests are increasingly threatened with the use of force to shut them down, and civil rights leaders and journalists have been accused of and jailed for alleged plots that Modi's opponents say are the work of a weaponized justice system. And while all of this is already deeply troubling, we chose to present a story on India's election cycle today not just to bring attention to Modi's overreaches, but to connect the dots. With 44 days of elections, almost a billion eligible voters, and such an intense ethno-nationalist animus already on full display among the population, we here at Warographics have got to present the other possibility, that India's election cycle becomes a flashpoint in itself. Now look, we're not anticipating any invasion of India from a foreign power or any uprising among a discontented minority. In fact, we'd like to sound the alarm on the exact opposite. With the majority party surging on a wave of populism, empowered to express resentment and extremism by the national leadership, and granted a permissive environment to commit acts of violence, we expect an election cycle marked by voter intimidation, acts of violence against minority communities, and quite likely outbursts of mob violence as well. In nations where a populist leader swings their nation toward authoritarianism, elections, especially in recent decades, tend to become points of no return. At those moments, 
the political opposition is incentivized to demonstrate, organize, and act before things get worse. But the populist movement that already leads such a government is empowered by its political strength to act ferociously at large scale to ensure that nothing can stand in the way of its continued political dominance. Fight hard enough, viciously enough, and they can usher in a new term for the same political leaders who've shown no intention to prosecute them. Fail to fight hard enough? and they risk the opposition coming back into power and holding them responsible for the crimes and abuses they did commit. Over the next several weeks, India is going to be in the throes of that same political predicament. We trust that India will make it to the other side. We trust that Modi will still be in power when that happens. But in the intervening time, things are probably going to get rather ugly. And for our final story today, we return to Africa, where a once key American alliance is now hanging by a thread. For those who track what's happening in the Sahel region, it was a depressingly familiar sight. On Friday, April 12th, news broke that about 100 Russian soldiers had arrived in Niger, invited guests of the military junta that installed itself in Niamey after a coup last summer. Bringing with them a state-of-the-art air defense system, the soldiers were reported by Russian state media to be members of the Africa Corps, remnants of the Wagner Group that were rebranded after a failed insurrection by leader Yevgeny Prigozhin. Although small in number, the deployment followed a similar one to Burkina Faso earlier this year, a country that borders Niger and also recently suffered a military takeover. Likewise, Burkina Faso's neighbor, Mali, invited Wagner in following its own coup in 2021. Taken together, the three deployments now give Russia a firm foothold in West Africa, one the Kremlin will likely use to expand its influence and exploit natural resources. Yet while the arrival of Wagner forces was unsettling in both Mali and Burkina Faso, the news from Niger represents a far bigger security challenge. That's because Niger is supposed to be a key American ally, one that's home to a base from where 1,100 US personnel carry out vital reconnaissance work against transnational Islamist terror groups. Groups that, were they allowed to grow unhindered, would pose a grave threat to members of the Western Alliance. As US Africa Command Head General Michael Langley recently warned, the collapse of Washington's military cooperation with Niamey could, quote, degrade our ability to do active watching and warning, including for homeland defense. To understand why, you only need to have a look at a map. Sat slap bang on the ribbon of land where the Sahara gives way to the savannah, Niger is part of the region known as the Sahel, which runs all the way from Mauritania in the west coast to Sudan's Red Sea coast in the east. Exactly what constitutes a Sahel state is debatable, since different governing bodies use different definitions and sometimes draw distinctions between countries that are geographically part of the region and those that are politically part of it. However you cut it, though, there's one thing all experts can agree on. The Sahel is deeply troubled. From something of a backwater, the region has changed in the last two decades to become the absolute epicenter of Islamist terrorism. In 2023, the Wilson Center reported that 43% of all deaths caused by jihadist violence worldwide took place there. This rise has been fueled by growing numbers of insurgencies fighting against weak states. Mali and Burkina Faso are currently battling sprawling rebellions, while other countries like Nigeria and Chad are dealing with less powerful but no less dangerous regional insurgencies. Now, as someone sitting thousands of kilometers from these hotspots, you might reasonably react to this by saying something like, <laughs> sucks for those countries, but why should I care? And the answer lies in the international ambitions of many of these armed groups. The jihadists fighting in the Sahel are an unsavory bunch, including local affiliates of Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. Many of them would dearly love to slaughter not just their local enemies, but also Europeans and Americans. Since 9-11, the Pentagon has taken such ambitions extremely seriously, which is where Niger comes in. Located at the heart of the Sahel, Niger is the perfect place from where to fly long-range drones that can carry out surveillance and monitoring of armed groups across the region. Hence the agreement the US signed with Niamey in 2016, allowing for the construction of a drone base near the remote desert town of Agadez, something America reciprocated by pouring almost a billion dollars into Niger's economy, running projects to get healthcare and clean water to a population that counts among the world's poorest. To be clear, the Americans weren't the only ones in the mix, as a former French colony Niger played host in this era to a substantial French presence that helped combat local insurgents. Moscow, too, had its own foothold, selling weapons and offering military training. Still, it was the US which loomed largest, which seemed most committed to developing Niger's future as a democracy, a commitment that seemed to pay off in 2021 when the country underwent its first ever democratic transition of power. And then, July 2023 came along and blew everything up in Washington's face. 
The Niger coup was one of last summer's great geopolitical shocks, an arms takeover that briefly looked as if it would lead to interstate war when the regional grouping ECOWAS threatened military intervention. That threat ultimately turned out to be empty, but the repercussions of the junta's rise were still massive as Niger flipped from a nation broadly in the West's camp to be one that's much more aligned with America's enemies. The first sign of this was the expulsion of French forces, all of whom were made to leave by December 2023. This was followed up by an opening of the country to nations which we might collectively describe as anti-West. In 2024 alone, delegates from China, Iran, and Russia have all arrived in Niamey seeking contracts to extract oil and uranium or forge security partnerships with the junta. Then last month, Niger's new leaders made their boldest announcement yet. With anti-American protests gripping the capital, they ordered the US military to abandon its Agadez base and leave. According to foreign policy, local officials claimed they were fed up with America acting condescending towards them. U.S. officials said the decision was due to Washington pressing the junta to return to civilian rule. Whatever the truth, the outcome was the same. Although American personnel still remain in their base at the time of writing, they are no longer flying drone missions or collecting intelligence. With Russian personnel now in Niger, it seems likely Agadez Air Base may soon be abandoned altogether. If that happens, it'll be a major blow for Uncle Sam, not just because counterterrorism efforts will have to be redirected to less geographically well-placed nations like Benin, Côte d'Ivoire, or Ghana, but because it'll also show how Washington's Sahel policy has effectively failed. For decades, America has tried to coax poor African states onto its side with promises of development money, provided that certain milestones are hit regarding human rights and rule of law. Back when a few alternatives existed to American power, that was enough. But as more and more nations from enemies like China and Russia to allies like Turkey and UAE started offering African capitals advanced weapons without any caveats, the American offer started to look less tempting. To some, it even began to look paternalistic and insulting. As Cameron Hudson eroded foreign policy recently, with alternatives for security assistance and investors that come with no lectures on democracy, African countries have increasingly low tolerance for even perceived slights. That means the US may soon have to come up with a new way of doing business with the undemocratic regimes, or risk watching its influence fade in a region it regards as critical for its security. To be clear, it's still not certain at this stage that Naame really will force an American withdrawal. According to senior US officials quoted in the New York Times, Niger's junta is secretly asking Washington to quote, revise the security partnership with the United States, not to abandon it. This may be because the Hunter are aware that Russia's forces do not provide much protection against jihadists. Despite 2,000 troops in Mali and ex-Wagner forces in Burkina Faso, both nations have suffered spiraling security problems and increased terror attacks since Western forces pulled out and Moscow moved in. Indeed, there's evidence that the 100 Africa Corps troops who arrived in Niamey last week aren't even intended to battle Islamist insurgents. Speaking to the BBC, the Sahel specialist Ulf Lasing suggested that they might instead be there as part of a regime of survival package in case ECOWAS suddenly makes good on its threat to invade Niger to restore democracy. To bolster his case, he pointed out that the new air defense system couldn't have any other purpose, saying, I don't have any other explanation because jihadists don't have planes. Still, even if a secret deal is ultimately struck to keep Agadez Air Base open, the recent events in Niger still show that the West can no longer take its alliances for granted. As the chasm between Western-style democracies and, and autocracies in the mold of Russia and China grow, a mad dash is beginning to unfold to get as many wavering countries on side as possible, to strike bargains with strategically important nations like Niger and move them firmly into one camp or the other. Right now, it looks like the autocracies, with their promises of conditionless weapons transfers, may have the better offer. Not because they can match American spending or power, but because they ask less of those who they negotiate with. Whether a return to the brutal, real politic of the Cold War would fly in a modern America is another story. But if Russia's recent expansion into Niger makes one thing clear, it's that the West needs to think carefully about how it does business with unsavory regimes in the future. Whether that means by lowering its standards or by finding more transactional ways to engage is something only our leaders can decide.